Set our souls on fire, Lord, for thy holy word. Burn it deep within us, and let your voice be heard. Amen. Please be seated. Sometimes I wonder if I've gone numb after simply surviving 18 months of an acute COVID crisis, absorbing the excruciating trauma of those experiencing homelessness during a pandemic, and reinventing overnight what it means to minister to our city's most vulnerable people in this time and place. And then, I witness something that utterly breaks my heart, and I know I am still alive. Numbness can be described as being devoid of feeling. But when you experience heartbreak, you get that awful lump in your throat, an ache in your chest, and you feel deeply. I give thanks for God's grace that my heart has not yet hardened completely. With the time change, I leave work in the dark these days. A few nights ago, I crossed the street to the common on my way to the garage and came upon a homeless woman laying on top of a wagon loaded with a mountain of stuff. She was sleeping vulnerably exposed to the cold night air, even with a heavy coat, and was parked next to a trash can overflowing with garbage. I stopped to check on her, and as she waved me off, I could feel that awful ache in my chest welling up as I confronted a world where a helpless young woman is just left on the street to sleep on top of her cart. Dissolving into tears as I crawled through the night air, screaming for Jesus, I thought about a poem I think you will know. The Second Coming by William Butler Yeats. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere, everywhere, the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revel rel revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly those are those words out when the vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Lord, have mercy. A shape with lion body and a head of a man moves its slow thighs as it slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Yeats conjures up a horrible image of what is to be born as he sees a vision from Spiritus Mundi, the soul of the universe, the spirit of the world. 
This is the image Yeats fears will be born out of anarchy as the world falls apart and the center can no longer hold. His poem was first published in 1920, just after the First World War, the bloodiest war in history. And Yeats had a prophetic vision of an established order that was coming to an end. And there would be an apocalyptic period coming along that would be chaotic, anarchic, and innocence would be drowned in blood. It sounds terrifying as he aptly describes the breakdown of civilization, a time when old certainties can no longer be relied upon and people are easily led astray, a time of incredible instability and vulnerability. This, I believe, is what the prophecy in the book of Daniel and the Gospel of Mark are trying to awaken us to as we read them now in our current transition point in history. There shall be a time of anguish such as never occurred since nations first came into existence. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Nations will rise against nations. There will be earthquakes and famines and many will be led astray. I fear that we are in a similar time of instability and vulnerability. And Jesus warns not to lose our center of gravity, which is God. William Butler Yeats believed that history moved in a spiral motion with points of transition that mark the ending of one cycle and the beginning of the next, an apocalypse. He envisioned a world that had lost its center as the spirals became so wide that it could no longer hold together, turning and turning in the widening gyre. For Yeats, a gyre was like a tornado in reverse, a small point that widens as it rises up until it becomes so wide it can no longer hold its shape. He likens this to the relationship between the falcon and the falconer. As the falconer sends the falcon off to survey the land, the arc of the falcon widens until all communication between the falcon and the falconer is lost and the relationship breaks down. The falcon can no longer hear the falconer, he says. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Yeats wrote this poem at a time when he witnessed systems falling apart and governments beginning to collapse. A time of global misery and destruction when nothing made sense anymore and chaos would ensue. Yeats hypothesized there was a period of waiting between the spiral widening and losing its shape and a new center that would have to be formed to keep the cycle of history in motion. He named these as points of transition and felt they were both positive and negative, negative in the chaotic falling apart, and yet positive in the new opportunity to begin again with a new kind of order. Jesus, before Yeats, had a similar vision. On the Mount of Olives, Jesus described to his disciples his own vision of the world as they knew it, falling apart. He warns of the destruction of the temple, false prophets leading people astray, wars and earthquakes and famines in his own apocalyptic prophecy. He tells Peter, James, John, and Andrew 
not to be concerned with the timing of this destruction, but to remain attentive to the fact that these things must happen to make way for something new. This is the beginning of the birth pangs, he explains. William Butler Yeats, like Jesus, understood that things must break down and fall apart for something new to emerge. Something must end to make way for something new. Birth pangs are painful. They begin intermittently and become more constant, lurching at times as the birth gets closer. Fear and anxiety are natural and normal as one life gives birth to another. How will it go? What will change? When will it take place? Humans seem to want to know the timing of everything because we are timekeepers. Jesus warns not to be distracted by time, but to focus on truth instead. Focus on love. Focus on God as we wait for this new beginning. To keep the focus on being in right relationship with God as our center. So that we can begin to be in right relationship with one another. We aren't there yet. We aren't there yet. Advent is a time of waiting, a time of anticipation and expectation for something better, something more loving, more generous, something more Christ-like, something that feels like hope. Author Elio Delio caught my attention this week as she spoke about Advent on a short video clip. She asked, If God has already become incarnate in Jesus, then what are we waiting for? She suggests that it is we who are asleep in the manger, waiting on the God who is already here, and that God is waiting for us to wake up to a new consciousness of God in our midst. I'm intrigued by that. I wonder if that would change my stance, my expectation, my prayer, during this Advent season? Would it encourage me to wait actively instead of passively in prayer and in service, knowing that God might be waiting on me rather than the other way around? This is but the beginning of the birth pangs, Jesus says, and you've heard it said, my friends, that we are the midwives. We have reached another transi transition point in history, and as far as I can see, civilization has lost a bit of its shape. And maybe, just maybe, that is precisely because God is at the center, creating something new. God is with us and for us, imploring us to change, beckoning us to be in right relationship with each other, with all of creation, and with Jesus. Set our souls on fire, Lord, for thy holy word. Burn it deep within us and let your voice be heard. <laughs>